Uh, it's a very great pleasure uh, to be uh, asked to moderate this panel. And uh, we began uh, searching for a topic uh, several months ago. And in our first uh, effort, we came up with uh, Mind the Gap. And we were going to focus on uh, the generation gap. But when we, we had, had a couple of meetings on Skype, and uh, basically I said, nah, boring topic, don't want to do that one. And so uh, as we talked uh, among each other, uh, we, we came to this uh, idea of uh, how do you engage Buddhist practice in the world today? And out of that, uh, I'm not quite sure, I think it was from you, Kelly, uh, this do-it-yourself Buddhism. And then we tack on the tagline, what's new now? And uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. And in, in terms of the people on the panel here, uh, I've known Stephen since 1976, I think, is when we mm -hmm. first met. And uh, our paths have crossed at various times, and we've had a lot more interaction in the last few years. Uh, but uh, I know he has done a lot of exploration of finding his own path in various ways. I had the pleasure of meeting Hokai at the last Buddhist Geeks conference and uh, was just fascinated uh, with his path and explorations. And uh, Vince put me in touch with Kelly uh, in connection with Buddhist Geeks and as she and I talked, I realized that she would be a perfect person for this panel uh, because uh, she's coming from a completely d different perspective than uh, Stephen or I or Hokai. Uh, and one of the things I can say about all three of these people is that they're experts in do-it-yourself Buddhism. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to, uh, and we're going, just going to have a, a conversation here uh, today. So I want to start off with a, a question for Stephen. Uh, to my mind, uh, do-it-yourself Buddhism actually starts with the Buddha. So I'd, I'd just like you to say a word about that. Well, um, this sounds very loud. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Um, yes, I think it does. I think the idea of do-it-yourself Buddhism, which of course, you know, nowadays DIY sounds a little bit sort of superficial perhaps, but the locus classicus of the idea of DIY Buddhism, <laughs> I think is found in uh, the... Be gentle on people, please, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm just showing off. Um, uh, the... the, the, the the, the, cla the classic starting point for the idea of do-it-yourself in the Dharma is, uh, to my mind, found in the famous uh, parable of the raft, where the Buddha imagines a person who goes, uh, he's on a journey and he finds himself on the bank of a great expanse of water and he has to get across. And there's no bridge, there's no ferry boat. Um, all he can do is put together um, a raft. And the text actually says, I've got it here, suppose I collect grass, twigs, branches, and leaves and bind them together as a raft and supported by the raft and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Now, this uh, parable, I feel, is actually... I was reminded this morning when Rohan was speaking, and, and apparently nowadays this is called hacking. That, <laughs> <laughs> that you, um, in other words, you, uh, you don't wait around for some perfect form of Buddhism to take you in comfort and style across this great body of water, but it suggests that there's a kind of urgency at stake. And I think life is full of moments of urgency where we can't just fall back on some organized religious tradition or teaching, but we have to do it ourselves. We have to make use of what is in our environment. In this case, twigs, branches, leaves. Nowadays, it would be you know empty oil drums, styrofoam wrapping, and all this kind of stuff. And the, you put this together, and the only criterion is, does it float? <laughs> Can I use this to get across the river? Uh, and I don't even bother with a paddle or in a motor. I just paddle away with my hands and my feet and I get to the other shore. And when I get to the other shore, I don't then think, wow, that was an amazing raft. Let's 
carry it with me when I continue, you put it down. And this shows to me very vividly and very beautifully, I think, that the challenge of uh, the practice is, is to have within oneself or to find within oneself the resources um, and also a kind of native intelligence to be able to adopt elements that are perhaps not Buddhist at all, but which help you put together a vehicle for a specific purpose which you can then put down. And at the conclusion of this parable, the Buddha says, uh, and likewise, uh, uh, this is the case with the Dharma, and the Dharma is not for grasping, it is for crossing over. In other words, he acknowledges the danger that we can become very attached to our vehicles and we start setting up our traditions, our schools, our practices as somehow uh, goals in themselves, ultimate values, rather than expedient means to perform a certain task which we can then leave behind once that task is performed. And so I would say that's the guiding image uh, of do-it-yourself Buddhism. But maybe you could say something about that, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and what are the dangers in the approach that Stevens... Well, he chose the wrong locus classicus. <laughs> 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 so what's the right locus classicus? Well, I would go for the last words of the Buddha. Uh, you know, strive diligently, work out your own liberation or... Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I was kidding, of course, about <laughs> the raft analogy. It's perfect. But there's more than one place where the Buddha actually uh, emphasizes, be a light unto yourself, um, which when put in context clearly is not a, an instruction to forget about everyone else or to forget about guidance and stuff like that. Yeah. It's an admonition, I would think, universal to all, all styles of Buddhism that there is a self-reliance at the heart of the practice and that there's a, uh, there a, a self-responsible uh, impulse, which somehow makes Buddhism quite distinctive, uh, wherein it's not only specific for Buddhist contemplatives, but it somehow became generalized in the Buddhist tradition, whereas in, in most other religions, big traditions, only you know, strictly contemplative practitioners have this kind of uh, self-reliant spirit. It's somehow more public in the Buddhist tradition, I think. Mm -hmm. But as you said, DIY is these. I think the iconic picture is is a hammer. Is it? Or I read too much Wikipedia. Uh, like Home Depot DIY hammer. Home Depot, yeah, and and the hammer and stuff like that. And then in culture, it's like punk music and and zines and stuff like that. Somehow connected to the DIY idea, and this kind of rugged uh, independence and not relying on, on experts, not relying on help. So in this case, I think DIY has, has a little bit of a different connotation. However, I would absolutely agree with, with what you said, that, that the Buddhist history is full of examples where methods have become sacrosanct uh, idols mm. and wherein the questioning potential and the capacity to critically re you know retrospect on your own path and on the path of your fellow practitioners has been severely diminished and m so far many reformist great buddhist figures have have i think pointed out to the diy core spirit of, of the Buddhist Dharma. Well, yep. uh, let, let's take that a step further because uh, you're talking about uh, people who've uh, reformed or um, innovated in Buddhism. Yeah. And one of the great uh, innovation traditions uh, is, is the Chan, which became Zen, which was a, a reaction to uh, exactly what you're talking about. And uh, Kelly, you have a background here. Uh, what is your experience here with... Do DIY and uh, and Zen because I know, and 
because I know you've been kind of thrown out on your own in a certain sense. Yeah, just to give a little background about that statement, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> is um, I was formerly studying with um, a Zen Roshi, and um, due to just plain old human scandal, community and um, everything kind of just broke down and, and ended. And so in that sense, you know, kind of you, you, you were thrown into the, into the river. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, but to get back to something more interesting, um, DIY Buddhism, <laughs> um, I think it, like you said, is inherent. It's, you know, that's how the Buddha started. And I think DIY Buddhism is inherent in everyone's practice in this room. You have to do it yourself. You have to get up. You have to get to the cushion. You have to sit. And so no one else is going to do that for you. So in that sense, mm -hmm. that's where I feel mm -hmm. like the DIY mm -hmm. kind of really fits in with the Buddhism part and that we're always doing it ourselves, no matter if we're formally you know, with a, with a teacher, if we're not with a teacher, no one's going to practice for you, so it's really up to you. Okay. So, that sounds, comes back to you, Stephen. So, Kelly's describing the, uh, the paddling. The paddling, yeah. <laughs> yes, you know, you have to do it w with yourself. Uh, do you see any stages uh, in uh, this, when you're doing, because Hokai was talking about it, it not meaning that you're just all on your own, you do it, you make it up yourself, and things like that. So, do, does it strike you that there are possibly phases in this? Well, I, my own sense is that um, uh, at the outset, um, let's say someone were, to, a young person would come to me and say, I want to practice Buddhism. I would recommend initially to get a very good training in a particular tradition. I don't think it matters which one, one clearly that suits your temperament, your, your makeup. Um, and I do think you need to get a grounding in a certain tradition. I think you need to suspend your own uh, egotistic sense that I can do all this by myself. Certainly DIY doesn't mean a kind of ignoring of tradition, ignoring of uh, the wisdom and the skills of others. Mm. I think we do need to get that groundedness. But once one has that, I feel that particularly today, uh, we're exposed to such a diversity of Buddhist traditions. We're exposed to such a diversity of Buddhist philosophies and texts and books and so on that we find ourselves in a very unique position in the history of the Buddhist tradition where suddenly uh, we find ourselves confronted with such a pluralist, pluralistic, diverse range of approaches. And I think it's a great richness of our time that once we have a grounding in a particular tradition, we can then evolve and develop our own practice by drawing elements from different uh, schools, uh, different uh, ideas, different teachers, such that we begin more and more to refine our practice in terms that really uh, meshes and fits with our own particular temperament, but also our own particular needs at a given time in our lives. Okay. Uh, may, may, may I yes, build please. on that? Yeah. I, I came to completely the same conclusion. Mm. I came to think about it as the hourglass mm. uh, process, where you start by informing yourself of the mm. existing options. Mm. You see which one uh, uh, resonates mm. with your uh, uh, temperament or your mm. you know, aesthetic uh, you know, affiliations. Mm. Sometimes style mm -hmm. speaks to you more than doctrine. Yeah. Mm. And maybe personal connection, too. Of course, yeah, and, and also the realistic possibilities of pursuing some kind of practice, because, you know, if, if, the, te if the only teacher lives on Mars, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not viable for, for you, <laughs> you know, something like that. And, uh, and then, once you have found a realistic, you know, possibility, and, and you actually see it could work, you go deep, that's the point where the hourglass, you know, goes narrow. You go deep with that, and once you break through the... the, the the, the, how do you call when the river goes between two rocks? Uh, a ravine? Yeah. yeah. One, Rapid. Or and it's usually a dangerous place, right? right? Where you need to face your own fears. <laughs> <laughs> and once you break through that narrow experience, then you can again appreciate the diversity of which you were speaking in the open market of ideas, practices, experiences. So yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Those three phases, I think, are crucial. Yeah. Well, one, I, I, I'm going to throw this one to Kelly because uh, 
One of the challenges, I think, in, uh, when, when starting in Buddhism is exactly what Stephen was referring to, that there's a plurality of, of, of choice. And uh, what, what would be helpful in, in being able to navigate that plurality of choice and be able to make choices? I'm a big fan of assessments, so... Pardon? I'm said I'm a big fan of assessments, so, uh, <laughs> so it might be interesting to... So talk about that a bit. Um, maybe even take a more kind of scientific approach with your own self, your own interiors, and matching up. What are you looking for? What do you want? Why? You know? Okay, so, so <laughs> these are questions you're recommending that people ask themselves. Yeah, okay. yeah, and to people really, are... really dig into to that motivation to see if you're, like, reacting to something mm -hmm. um, or if you're authentically being drawn towards something. I think those are really important distinctions to make before you enter practice because if you're just reacting to something and then you enter practice, I think that's going to really um, Avoid, taint. So, so don't yeah. practice on the bounce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't practice on the bounce, people. <laughs> <laughs> How could you tell that? It's just like self-inquiry, you know, okay. so you got to do right. it yourself. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, do you have anything to add on to that? No. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, I mean yes, uh, uh, yeah, that, that sounds... That well, I, uh, my, my own, I wonder if we approach religion in such a rational way. Um, uh, in my own case, when I landed in India at the age of 19, um, I certainly didn't look around and check out the different Buddhist <laughs> traditions. I didn't go to Kalimpong and look at the Kagyupas and then go to Dharamsala and look at the Gelupas. There were and say, Kajus in, what? There were Kajus in Kalimpong? Sorry? I missed them. Well, whoever they were. But in any case, um, I think there's also an element uh, here of, uh, I, well, chance or karma or whatever you mm -hmm. call it, that you somehow fall into a tradition. That's, that's how I felt. I yeah. felt I just kind of stumbled into. Yeah. Uh, I, I was confused. I didn't really know what my life was about. I didn't really know what my real questions were. And I fell into the first Tibetan community I met. Uh, I was incredibly impressed with the people, the lamas, not just the lamas, but the, the ordinary men and women, exiles from their country. And it was that encounter that just made me say, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Now, that was quite irrational. It was very much from the heart, it was very much from the gut, and it was a jump into the dark, to be quite frank. It was a leap, and uh, it was the best leap in the dark I ever made. Oh no, Ken, how was your... Yeah, Ken, tell us about yours. <laughs> tell us, Ken. <laughs> uh, it began in Tehran, actually. <laughs> and... Uh, One of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, like you, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I was staying at this hostel outside Tehran, and I got the idea, I will go to India and study Buddhism. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I'd read one and a half books on Buddhism while I was at college. And, uh, and then, just as you described, there were a series of fortuitous meetings. Uh, somebody at that hostel gave uh, me a name of a place to stay outside Delhi. At that, uh, the monk that was there, it turned out, we thought it was, uh, I can't remember what we thought it was, but it, it turned out to be a Buddhist mission. But the monk, uh, who was a good teacher, wouldn't take me on because he was planning to travel. A Dutch nun gave me Kala Rinpoche's name because I was Canadian and we were eligible for uh, six-month visas for Darjeeling, unlike most people. <laughs> so we went there and, and then screeched to a halt. <laughs> and uh, like you, it wasn't irrational. And, and I'm just weighing what uh, Kelly says because I find that I give people advice, exactly the advice that Kelly <laughs> suggested, and, and it's totally rational approach. You know, what are you looking for and things and find that, but it's not what I did at all. <laughs> and so uh, I, I want to pick up a, a theme from uh, that I mentioned this morning is that. We have a tendency to look at our lives, and, and, and because we're thinking and relating to everything in terms of what do what my interest uh, and what uh, am I looking for, we stay, there's possibly a tendency to stay in our own world. But what Stephen is describing 
and what I went through was just like going out there and finding ourselves in totally different worlds and having to relate to it. And, you know, both of us had to learn Tibetan in order to communicate with our teachers and, and so forth. So uh, I'm going to go back to you, Kelly. What sure. do you think about this? Well, it raises the second part of our panel, what's new now? Okay. Um, what's new now is I don't need to travel to India. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I can go to Google. <laughs> I can type in Western Dharma teacher. <laughs> I can get a whole, a whole list of um, different schools and sects and teachers and online retreats and YouTube videos and uh, DVDs for sale and processes to go through and conferences to attend. Um, so there's a richness available now that wasn't available when you guys were, were um, undergoing your practice and study. Um, and so I think that changes the game a lot. It was a game changer. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, not that that's better or worse. It's just yeah. different. Yes. Um, so it has its own, you know, greatness. It has its own pros and cons. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not trying to say one's better than the other. Um, but just really speak to the, the what's new now part. Um, I mean, basically, you guys were just kind of got a plane ticket and went, and who knows what happened? Uh, it wasn't a plane ticket, ticket. or bus uh. ticket, boat? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Raft. <laughs> thumb. Thumb. A big thumb. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I can go on a on a whole weekend retreat just from my couch, and that's insane. <laughs> I mean, is it insanely good, insanely convenient, insanely bad? What? All of it, you know? Okay, yeah, all right, all right. All of it. So I, I just think, um, yeah, the internet with the uh, distribution of um, spiritual wisdom teachings available to anyone now with access to, a, to internet and computer uh, is, is a huge game changer and just made um, the accessibility of, of Buddhism yeah. that much greater. Um, Okay, what do you see as the potential benefits and pitfalls of what Kali's describing? Well, I, I, would, I wouldn't know, you know. I, uh, among the Buddhist geeks, uh, uh, like, folks, I am uh, in the skeptical uh, camp about uh, potentials. <laughs> <laughs> and more, more, more with my eye on dangers. Uh, that's probably my natural inclination. But uh, I think that uh, what, what, what's new now is that part of the cultural gap uh, has been bridged. Like, the foundations for the bridge are there on both sides of the gap, I would say so. Now what, we, we, describe what you see as the gap here. In, in the, in the, in the, in the, the, there was the classical situation, which we called pre-modern, where you basically had <laughs> monocultures, uh, rarely... Uh, interacting or bridging between them. And when it would happen, it would be a historical event, like Buddhism going from India even to the adjacent Tibet. That was a, you know, a huge event, culturally, civilization building and stuff like that. But then, in the modern period, we had this possibility of importing, exporting, of folks like you becoming expats for a while, in India, uh, becoming uncultured there, and then coming back home being like foreigners, at least spiritually, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yes. Coming <laughs> back, definitely. yeah, coming back home, which didn't feel anything like home, spiritually. But now the situation is a little bit new in that sense, is that we are kind of, uh, we, are, we are enjoying ourselves, you know, in this very thin layer of westernized, naturalized Buddha Dharma of all three vehicles. But we see some pretty bad statistics now. Uh, interest dropping since 2000, according to Google. Interest in what? Interest in words like Zen, Vipassana, Vajrayana. <laughs> You know, but in look, public look, domain look is dropping. Look what's happening to mindfulness, as Willoughby was talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, boomers who have uh, typically, as a generation, made this initial uh, uh, 
gap bridging process a reality or, you know, understandably because of biological reasons. <laughs> you know becoming less and less capable of 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 you know carrying this burden <laughs> well, i feel there should be a modicum of respect here <laughs> no we have to think ahead <laughs> and you know uh well this is new <laughs> and it's new. Let's let's speak frankly. It's news for boomers. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we're getting old. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the, the situation is different because we're you know we're we're kind of comfortable with what what Kelly described. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering how stable it is. You know, once we're de-boomerized. <laughs> I'm, I'm already thinking not what's new, I'm thinking what's next yeah. so that we better interpret uh, the, the now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it a potential or is it a, you know, thin ice situation? And uh, in that sense, DIY should be defined very differently. Because if you, if you want to uh, define a, a sturdy, a, a functional and effective and not a just reactive mm -hmm. DIY approach, and to somehow reform this spirit in a natural, culturally appropriate manner, then you need to know what could be new in 10 years' time or 20 years' time. So I'm, I'm, this is what I'm thinking, and I, I don't have any answers. I, I have a couple of jokes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to throw it at you, Kelly. 10 years out, what do you see? 10 years out? I, and I'm sorry, this is taking... I'm not a futurist, total, I'll just say that. To the totally beginning. in a different direction from anything <laughs> that we've discussed. So we're, we're in our charter ter territory here. Ten years out, I, I think it's, it could go one of two ways. Um, because of the accessibility, because of um, the widespread distribution of, of the study and practice of Buddhism through the internet and computers and technology, one, there could be a surge, there could be um, interest could rise, there could be more younger people who tend to be a little bit more tech savvy than the boomers, um, logging on and, and being more interested in these kind of things. Um, and actually a surge of Buddhism in the West, actually kind of a revival, Buddhism 2.0. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, or... That's the best case. That's the best case scenario. <laughs> or, um, or Buddhism dies in the West and needs to be reborn. Well, like Lama Suri Das was talking about last night. Stephen, in one of our conversations, you referred to an uptick in uh, retreat enrollment. So, um, com com coming from the, the spread of meditation, I, I recall an email exchange I had with Willoughby in which she said the primary dispensers of meditation mm -hmm. practice in uh, American culture mm -hmm. right now are um, healthcare professionals and, mm -hmm. uh, and academics. Mm -hmm. uh, and, in other words, people like us are obsolete, mm -hmm. as I was talking about this morning. But at the same time, you were talking about the phenomenon you'd recognized at Gaia House. Well, at the moment, I get the sense that uh, meditation retreats have never been so popular, at least in the centers uh, that I'm teaching at. Yeah, and, and, I, and they're, they're not just boomers attending. Yeah. No, not at all. It, okay. it, we're getting a much wider demographic mm -hmm. of people coming on retreats, um, and they're coming from you know all kinds of backgrounds. I think... Uh, Buddhi Buddhism and Buddhistic ideas, mindfulness, meditation, have become more and more um, integrated into our mainstream culture. I mean, I can remember back you know, when I was 20 or so, um, if Buddhism was mentioned in the press, usually it was looked at with a certain degree of skepticism, a certain cynicism. Um, it was something that maybe superannuated hippies are interested in. Yeah. Um, it was very marginal. It was scoffed at, made jokes <clears> of. <throat> Whereas nowadays, it's rather the opposite. You find that the general tone of, 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 of presentation of Buddhism is often respectful and, and deferential. I think figures like His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, have really just done an incredible PR job, if you wish, for um, really, uh, you know, making Buddhism something entirely acceptable and relevant and arguably 
um, offering us practices that we don't find in other traditions. We get people like Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. It goes on and on and on. I think there's been a mainstreaming now that means that Buddhist ideas are not seen as weird or alien or threatening or bizarre, mm -hmm. but actually things that you know ordinary, normal people could get a great deal of value from. And I think we're now drawing from that far wider pool uh, which leads people then to you know, to, 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 to study, to, to, to meditate, to practice. I think that's all very good. So, so through th things uh, like MBSR, which ha have made meditation far more accessible than it has ever mm. been historically, uh, people are finding a, a connection with something that speaks to them and then uh, uh, becoming interested in following mm. that wh wherever that path leads them. That's right. So let's take it back to you, Hokai. Do you still see dangers here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I can see danger everywhere. <laughs> he has a danger filter that's... <laughs> <laughs> you got to back it up now. Yeah. Okay. Um, the danger, uh, obviously, uh, the, the danger to the, to the DIY... Yes. Uh, at, at one hand is that uh, what we're talking about here, the, the DIY thing, this is not just, that's why I mentioned the popular image of the hammer and you pick up the, like the Ikea, you know, idea. That, that's like the most ridiculous DIY. You just put together the pieces they provide. Uh, that's not DIY. You know? So you think we could develop so, an Ikea Buddhism? Yeah. <laughs> So the danger is of developing, uh, you know, a, 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 an exper a false experience of DIY, a very shallow DIY experience where it said, yeah, that's it. Now you, uh, everyone can do it. But what everyone can do actually is put together an IKEA furniture, which is not to say that you have uh, bought a huge piece of lumber somewhere and then went from there. Uh, and made like, you know, like uh, allegedly Jesus would do when he was carving his, you know, table and chair. And mother said, okay, it's lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, I was talking about dangers. <laughs> so, uh, uh, that, that's one, one danger. Now, the, the meaning of DIY is actually uh, going as deep as you're interested, which indeed may be a very different thing for different people, and going deep in directions which may be different for different people. Uh, the direction of awakening is not there, nor there, nor there. Actually, it's everywhere. But as an individual, you cannot go in all directions at once, obviously. So you, you need to go in some direction. But perceived from the point of view of another individual, it will seem that you are not going towards awakening. Because, wait a minute, you're going there and I'm going there. We cannot be doing the same thing. So that's one of the problems. It's a newly arising kind of sectarianism, even there. Wherein the, the actual experience and practice of DIY would be to to integrate the experience of practice with the form of life you lead. That's, that's, the, that's the challenge. Because historically, DIY would be pursued even in Mahayana. Well, the, the rhetoric was lay, you know, Vimalakirti, he can do it, even better than, uh, who was it, Sariputta? Sariputta. Yeah, yeah. Even, the, even the Sariputta was ridiculous at the bedside, right? Mm -hmm. Even the great bodhisattvas, you know, yeah, appeared from nowhere. Manjushri. Yeah. Couldn't match. Even Manjushri couldn't match. And there was this <laughs> roaring silence, right? <laughs> but that's the rhetoric. The actual practice of Mahayana was mainly monastic when it comes to integrating uh, hardcore practice and a form of life for men and women both. Now, we're talking about something radically different here. And the challenge is to integrate a... A uh, form of life which is not intentionally rooted 
in principles in which the practice is rooted. So there will always be some dissonance there. We are, we are you know, speaking like this, we need to recognize there are, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, may maybe they are uh, in disguise, but there are no fully ordained, you know, uh, celibate uh, practitioners among us. Uh, I think I'm less disguised. One, <laughs> so we are we are speaking specifically of, about a also about an environment where Buddhism will never be a state religion or or a you know or the religion of our forefathers or so it's a completely different set of challenges and and forces pulling this DIY effort uh, in different directions and I find it actually exciting and you know uh, uh, like an invitation. Uh, when I talk about danger, I'm not talking about it in a, in a you know, pessimistic sense. Yes. But what Hokai is saying here reminds me of some of the themes you've been exploring in the last few years of um, philosophy as a way of life, Buddhism as a way of life, and perhaps you can comment on this. Um, well, going back a bit to what Hokai was saying, it, the, the notion of DIY, is, and then the sort of extension of that into Ikea-type furniture building, um, <laughs> I don't think really gives sufficient respect to the very deep and genuine questions and needs that people bring to Buddhist practice. Okay. Um, I, I'm a little afraid we, we, we don't acknowledge that. And I think that what often I experience with teaching on retreats, people who've had very little exposure to Buddhism, they don't perhaps even have a religious background at all, and yet the simple act of sitting quietly in a supportive environment allows them to ask the kinds of questions that are often taboo in our society. And I think all human beings, if they uh, touch into the reflective uh, part of their own experience, encounter the very primary Good. questions of the, the classic story of the Buddha going out of the palace, birth, sickness, aging, death. I think our society is very good at, at, at obscuring that, of denying it, of casting our attention elsewhere. And I feel for someone who might just do mindfulness as a way of stress reduction or something, very often what happens is that just taking that new perspective on their, their health issue also allows them to take a new perspective on the deepest questions yes, of their life. When you say our society, you are talking about a part of me. Yes. It's not, you know, the enemy is not out there. No, the enemy is not out there. The enemy <laughs> we have internalized as well. I agree with that. So, um, you know, th there's a part of me that would, uh, that would uh, appreciate a more simple, more, you know, <laughs> less dangerous and less problematic way, you know. Uh, DIY has a connotation of, of, of basically getting things done. Mm -hmm. That, that's the kind of goal. It doesn't have the connotation of entering a process which is deeply mysterious, mm. in which there is a lot of uh, opening up, trusting, mm. being guided by, not necessarily other people, but being guided by the intelligence of mm. that deeper process which you mm. say me, uh, all people have access to. But making that choice again and again and again, uh, so far, uh, hasn't been a continuous lineage in our culture. Mm -hmm. It has been broken off, some people say, in the 16th centuries mm -hmm. with the you know, uh, break of the Christian contemplative mm -hmm. tradition. So for, for most of us, uh, uh, you know, discovering these questions is a frightening uh, mm -hmm. uh, encounter. Well, I'd like to pick up uh, there and turn to Kelly here. So what brought you into practice? <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't rational at all. I actually am just <laughs> the same as you, telling people that. Um, I actually encountered one of my teacher's students and um, liked what I saw. Pardon? I liked what I saw from mm -hmm. the fruits of practice, and I said it was shiny, and I wanted, I wanted that. That's exactly what so, inspired, that's exactly <laughs> what inspired Buddha. Because mm -hmm. he saw the mendicant, and yeah. he said, how can this person be at peace when birth, old age, suffering? And it was... It was exactly what you're describing. Yeah. Right. And so I actually went to that person and said, will you be my teacher? No. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I guess I'll go to your teacher and ask. <laughs> and that's what I did. Okay. Yeah. So 
Uh, we're going to open it up for a... What, so, sorry, was that frightening? Which part? The, f <laughs> the asking and saying no and then... Or all of it. The, the, the movement of actually going for it. I wasn't frightened at all. I was so energized and I was so like gung-ho and just like, whew, let's do this. Let's jump right in. And I was just, just ready. Like just full, full jumping into the, the river. So you jumped out of your world too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So, <laughs> uh, how much time? We're going to open up for questions very shortly. In one minute. I, I just want to explore just for a moment and then get a recap from uh, each person here. Uh, I'm going to go back to Stephen's analogy of the raft and combine that with IKEA Buddhism, which is, I think, mm -hmm. our phrase for the, the afternoon. Uh, <coughs> where the one hand is, uh, if you, you use the uh, IKEA approach, where you have all of these things together and you have the illusion that you're making uh, your own furniture, but what I, actually you're doing is you're just, uh, uh, you're just expending your la uh, labor and time, yeah. uh, and that's why the furniture is cheaper, is because yeah. it's, it's costing you yeah. that. Uh, whereas what, uh, the analogy that uh, Stephen was coming from uh, at the beginning is uh, there, there aren't the pieces of the raft lying around. There's, there's nothing, and you're just having to look at the environment and figure out how to uh, put it together. What, what can be used as material. What yeah. can be used as material, exactly. And so you have to relate to the world very, very directly. There's nothing there for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that reflects back to your experience, where, you know, well, no, I'm not going to be your teacher, so you're just going to go for it. So I, I think that, yeah. uh, that, <laughs> that, that, that uh, urge, uh, that intention, like, you hit something inside yourself mm -hmm. that is so important that you're just going to act on it is a, is a very central piece. And I think that's uh, whatever, whatever it costs, wherever it There's takes a, you. There's a, um, a flavor of impulsivity even in that. Mm -hmm. Possibly, yes. So what are, just take a, a couple of sentences. Uh, we'll start with you, Hokai. Um, what is something you're taking out of this? I, I think that the road uh, ahead is unmapped and that, uh, that that provides a an incredible uh, uh, opportunity at, the, at this time. And it's not just about us in the West uh, or them, you know, in the East, because they face a similar set of challenges meeting modernity and the 21st century and political and economical shifts. I mean, it's a mess with the old uh, uh, mon monastic system, whether you look at Japan or Burma or okay. wherever. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that we uh, need to recognize that, that, that sometimes solutions come from unexpected places. Uh, we need to employ uh, not just original, as Shinzan Yang would say, thinking out of the box, but we need to put uh, different heads, different perspectives together, even people who have absolutely no experience in either Buddhism or, or meditation, as sometimes you would say business people, mm -hmm. who just happen to have the idea we never thought of. Uh, and And... I think that basically the only way of, of uh, moving forward the DIY idea is just uh, beginning to think afresh again and again and again. Kelly, a couple of sentences. Sure. Um, the next Buddha is a Sangha, Technahan um, said. And so for me, it brings out like DIY. You still have to do it yourself, but you can do it yourself together, all of us. Um, going back to an earlier point, but also carrying on from here, um, if I'd been asked back in 1975 or whatever um, to think ahead of how Buddhism would be in the next 10 or 20 years, I would have got it totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I could never have guessed what has actually unfolded in the last 30 or 40 years. So I'm not sure that it's very helpful to try to sort of prefigure what it is that we're aiming at or, or looking for. I think the challenge is actually 
to live, um, as Surya said last night, uh, the, the, the future is now. Okay. In other words, um, uh, what really matters is the actual uh, way we live authentically as possible uh, in each moment that unfolds. And I think the rest is really not our business. <laughs> and, and on that wonderful note, that was awesome. uh, let's open it up for questions. There's a mic here and uh, just uh, throw out your question. If you want to direct it at a particular person in the, on the panel, that's perfectly, uh, or we may just have everybody respond to it. Okay, good afternoon. Um, been trying to formulate it as a question. I'm very compelled by the conversation. Uh, so, can I just please go to the question directly because we want to get as many questions as possible. Okay, so uh, for somebody who's been practicing a number of years in Hokai, particularly the way you talked about the path as an hourglass, I've been doing this for 34 years. I'm very committed. When I look at myself, I'm very committed to Buddhism and I want Buddhism to happen. Um, you know, and I have this feeling that uh, there are there are still things to be discovered that I need to be in a formal arrangement to be able to explore them and discover them. And yet, at the same time, we have these experience of the difficulties of the formal arrangements, um, and. It, I just like where, <laughs> like where, where, where's the few? How do we create this new future of DYI? We can do, we can do it our own way, and yet there's still the need. I think. I mean, I still, after 34 years, feel this need is compelled to be in formal situations with somebody who's seen something further than what I've seen, okay. and yet not get caught in our in. Like, well, if you practice with those folks, you can't practice with these folks. I'm trying to make it short. I, okay. so. <laughs> I, I, I think that's clear. Hokai, do you want to respond to that? I'm not sure. I, okay. I somehow reluctant. I, I think that, yeah. no. Uh, I think this is, a, I, I, I really appreciate the, the, the honesty with which you yeah. articulated that. And I think it's something we all struggle with. I certainly struggle with it. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an unavoidable tension in our practice. Uh, it's perhaps, a, a, again, pointing to sign of a, some, finding some middle way approach whereby we're able to uh, fulfill our own authentic um, understanding of who we are and what our needs are, uh, and yet also to acknowledge that we have a great deal to learn uh, from people who have practiced longer than we have or simply have a different take on things. I would very much hope uh, in the West, and I think this is happening to a very large degree, um, an, an openness, a non-sectarianism that can allow us to feel uh, grounded in a particular tradition where we feel at home, but at the same time to be open to influences and inspirations uh, from teachers and traditions and practices that come from all over the place. And, and that's the terrain, I think, whether we like it or not, we find ourselves in, in the modern world. And I don't think there are any easy or simple answers to uh, your question, but I think it's a very important point to uh, acknowledge that that is the reality of many people's practice in the world today. Yeah. I would just add, uh, I don't think it's a new problem. And I am reminded of Chungpa Nalger, who's the founder of the Shangpa tradition in Tibet. He was a highly uh, respected Bun teacher who then studied Dzogchen, became a Dzogchen master, then became, uh, studied Mahamudra under two teachers. Um, the, the second of whom said, after a few months, you know everything that I know, uh, which Chungpa Nalger said under his breath, and that means you know nothing, because I know nothing. <laughs> and, and then at the age of 57, which is very old for a Tibetan in the 12th century or 11th century, undertook the journey to India and studied with teacher after teacher after teacher until he found what he was looking for. Mm -hmm. And listening to you, I would just urge you to, take, uh, uh, to follow your path wherever it leads. Mm -hmm. Please. 
Hi guys, my name is Nikki, and I'm from Seattle. And um, coming to this conference, I've 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 told my friends where I was going and what I was doing, and I did a bit of A/B testing with the words that I would use. So I would say something like, "Oh, I'm going to a Buddhist conference," and they'll be like, "Uh huh," and then I'd say, uh, "I'm going to kind of like a techy geeky." Buddhisty kind of thing, and I'd be like, "Oh, cool! Like, are there people doing like apps and stuff?" Or I, you know, and then I would put that into that A or B or C, a multivariate testing type of thing, and then I would say, "Oh, uh, I'm going to a meditation conference," and there'd be various kinds of reactions. Or I'd say, I'd go, "I'm going to a mindfulness." Uh, conference and there would be a different kind of reaction or maybe something similar to meditation and so I've realized that depending on what what I say the reaction and action would be different and I, I I'm from Seattle and there's some statistics out there that Seattle has like the most amount of atheists out there and sometimes there are some strong atheists who have some allergic reaction to any kind of ist or ism uh, and and so I found out that if I were to say as a Buddhist or Buddhism kind of conference, then the conversation would be very short. Uh, but if I talked about brain, technology, science-y kind of those kinds of words, then the conversation might be a little bit longer. And so my question to you guys, all of you guys, is: is is there is it possible to talk about meditation without Buddhism or Buddhist or any kind of ist ism or anything like that? Uh, is it possible to talk about meditation without any kind of ism? Is that right? Okay. Who wants to take it? I did the last one. Hokai, go on, you say something clever. <laughs> <laughs> what are the dangers here, Hokai? <laughs> <laughs> well, the danger is that you are talking in, in, in the... In the uh, <laughs> newly developed lingo of meditationism <laughs> without without knowing and actually there is a a school of thought experientialism in english it's it's an it's a latin word but we're in us so i'm not allowed to use those latin words <laughs> what is the word it's called epistemologist <laughs> Epistemologism, That's basically, Greek. if you want to... It's Greek, actually. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, no, no. The, the ism isn't Greek. The episteme and logos is. Yeah, but the ism is... <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> it's true. He made me look bad. <laughs> uh, so, is it possible to talk I, I think it's impossible to avoid a, a uh, pri priorly organized system of thought, yeah. mm. absolutely, and then pretend you can talk about anything, yeah. right? And it's not a new problem, and uh, I think the Buddha faced this problem when he was thinking, can I talk about this? And then he said, well, I'll have to, you know, talk with what we got in India, yeah? And he had this first idea that he could talk about it without referring to existing categories. But then he realized there's no way to do it. And then he just, you know, and it's not a compromise. It's just a natural way. Yeah. You, you t it's, it's one of the examples of taking the found materials mm. and constructing a new raft. Mm. Just in this case, conceptually and verbally. Now, there will always be an ism. And the atheists are very unfair when they treat everything else as an ism. <laughs> and the skeptics are even worse, uh, except especially the radical ones. So it's, you know, it's, it's good to be skeptical about your own ism, but you know, to talk about anything, you have to adopt a certain uh, discourse. And that discourse has inbuilt uh, hidden beliefs, always. So yes, I realize that you may, you may be hanging with the type of crowd that is, uh, hyper allergic to, uh, to uh, you know, explicit use of certain words, and you may use the skillful means of avoiding certain words, just as you wouldn't say F off to your parents, <laughs> but you would somehow express yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have the next. You know, 
making a face or something. So, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's about communication skills often, or as uh, Stephen suggested, it's about a good PR, okay. uh, a mindful PR in this case, may I warn you. Okay, we have time, <laughs> unfortunately, for only one more question, and please make it go straight to the question. <laughs> okay, so when you're doing a lot of different things, like you're going off to four or five different retreats with different teachers in different traditions, um, how do you get a coherent feedback loop? Oh. How do you get good feedback? Oh. Who's, who can kick your ass? <laughs> <laughs> From whom? From us? Or? Well, no, as, as a student going, doing a lot of different things, how do you get, mm. how do you know you're getting okay. coherent ah, feedback? Yeah. From experience or from those teachers? Uh, I, I'll take this one. I think yeah. Ken yeah. understands okay. my question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the point that Marie is raising is, I, I think, very important. Uh, I, I'm going to use. Uh, Kelly's and Stevens, my own experience of there's a, a kind of impulse you jump into it. And in today's world, realistically, most people are going to study with a number of teachers. And if you go back to uh, Hokai's hourglass model, a, a, um, a necessary step in the narrowing of that hourglass, which is when you, you're, you get uh, your feet held to the fire, so to speak, it's when you go deep, mm. is that you choose among your various teachers who is your primary teacher. Mm. And you make a commitment. And it's, it's not a commitment to that teacher, it's really a commitment to yourself. Yeah. And you say, this is the person that is going to be the final authority for me in my practice training. And now that can be a very, very difficult decision because you may find this person useful and this person useful and this person useful. But it, it is actually quite important that at some point in your spiritual uh, practice that you make that kind of commitment, whether it's to a teacher or to a tradition or something, because as Hokai was suggesting with the, the hourglass metaphor, it's the only way to really go deep. Uh, and this is something uh, Jamgun Kontrol, the great 19th century teacher, said, uh, when you're studying, study everything under the sun. When you're reflecting, keep a very, very open mind. When you practice, pick one thing and go. Yeah, the challenge is you get deeply in two different streams. Like there's two different, you know, Vajrayana and Insight, it's yeah. quite, quite different in the just different streams. Yeah. Well, as uh, my own teacher said to me, <clears throat> traveling, uh, traveling with a foot on two horses, it gets very difficult when the horses start going in different directions. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have to close here. Rohan, where are you? Okay. <laughs> and I, I just want to thank uh, all of you, Stephen and Kelly and uh, Hokai. Uh, Great discussion. A round of applause for the panel. And thank you, Ken. Yeah.